All right, and welcome back. So let's take stock for a minute before we get into this discussion of post-gestural or sometimes post-painterly abstraction and minimalism. By the early 60s, we had seen a real break with abstract expressionism. Kitsch had been elevated to the highest levels of art and had assumed an enormous amount of popularity, certainly by the mid-60s. So commercial items, things that were regarded as kitsch by Clement Greenberg had been elevated. Conceptualism had even gone to the point of absurdity of canning your own fecal matter, as in Manzoni's example here. And art had completely left the range of objecthood and monumentality that it had. Performance uh, was blowing up on the scene and was quickly going to expand beyond that. So if you're a modernist or if you're a painter, the question then is where do you go? Where do you go when the rest of the world has left you behind and decided that this universal modernist ideal was no longer operative? Well, as it turns out, there was quite a lot to build on. Even by the end of the 1950s, most of the modernists were moving away from this aggressive gestural painterly style, uh, the kind of gestural techniques of Motherwell, Klein, Pollock, and de Kooning. And they were already moving into the fields that we call color field, into the softer works of people like Rothko and Newman and Frankenthaler. When you look at a Rothko, um, even early on, there is a gestural quality to this. There definitely is, but it is far reduced relative to what, say, a Pollock or a de Kooning or a Klein would have produced. There's no aggressive brushstrokes. Everything is softened down. The gesture actually takes a second place to the color. One might even argue that the abstract painters were responding to conceptual art by creating more iconic images. In fact, this is something that a lot of people have discussed, that the kind of things that the pop artists and the conceptual artists were doing by trying to separate art from the object, the abstract expressionists and color field painters were already doing. Think about a Rothko. A Rothko feels like an experience of color. He is destroying the distinct brush marks and blurring out the edges, making this less about his expression and more about the concept. So there is a dialogue here. It would be wonderful to actually tease this out. No one, I'm certain, uh, has exactly understanding of how this came to be. Came to be. But it's clear that abstraction itself was moving in a more conceptual direction. A Rothko is a more conceptual piece than a Jackson Pollock, which is this kind of Jackson Pollock is a record of its own creation. It is really honed in on the technique, the drips, but um, a Rothko moves apart from that. You could see the same thing happening in a Lewis. Lewis would pour these paintings out, the artist loses the ability to make that expression because he is surrendering it to chance, to gravity. You can see the same thing in the works of Helen Frankenthaler, that these paintings were the production of being poured out onto the canvas with various intensities of dilution and saturation, which means that she had to be free and allow well, she didn't have to be free, she had to be resigned, I guess is a better way of putting it, to the process, that the process would take over and that the color would move where it wanted to move and you were no longer in control of it. And then, of course, Barnett Newman was moving in that direction as well, but in a much more regimented way. Yes, he had these deep areas of color, but those zips, those bright zips became pure abstractions against the more kind of expressive color. And so if art was going to move in a conceptual direction, it was clear that abstraction, one of these huge uh, pillars of modernism, 
was going to have to move in a more conceptual direction as well. And you can see the thinking changing. You know, Clement Greenberg is kind of watching his model of the universe, <laughs> this kind of, this movement towards pure truth as he imagined it, imagining abstraction moving to pure truth. That What is an abstract painting? It is a painting. It is paint on surface. It is what it is. And therefore it is universal and democratic and uh, universally accessible. And then suddenly you have soup cans and, you know, cans of crap and and performance artists screeching and everything else and suddenly you can't really say well, okay we're moving to a higher truth we're moving to a more pure truth uh things had shifted away from the artist's mark and the you know kind of object to the concept so in a way post painterly abstraction is a kind of response to that it is the creation of artwork that is intentionally more impersonal and anonymous, at least in a way, that is more linear and geometric. And it takes the expression out of it. And if it takes the expression out of it, then these become, they still retain, they're still abstract, they're still objects, they retain, they're still pretty monumental in size, they retain all those features of modernism, but they lose that pure expression. And, and again, I really can't think of any other way to explain this than this is an attempt of abstraction to justify itself in conceptual terms. If the conceptual artists are attacking modernism and saying modernism is decadent and it's just repetitive and it isn't going anywhere, it's the concept that makes the thing. And you have people like Joseph Kosuth putting up his pure conceptual pieces, then it forces abstract painters to say, okay, what is the concept concept behind abstraction? And of a necessity, they're going to move to something that is less expressive, something that is that takes the painter out of the equation. If the painter is the part that is the part of the equation and people want conceptual art, then we will give them pure abstraction and you can't get any more conceptual than that. And I think that's right. If you remember going all the way back to Kazimir Malevich and his black square, he made the argument that the black square is the only realist painting because it's real. What is it? It's a black square. Whereas, you know, naturalism or expression or anything else is some kind of illusion, some kind of layering on top of that that is completely unneeded. That's why he wanted to get back to his zeroth degree. So I think that's why they go in this direction. And they have, a, you know, an obvious champion in this, and that's going to be Clement Greenberg himself. So Clement Greenberg trying to basically say that, you know, hey, this this is the direction we're going to go. We kind of had this exuberant moment of abstraction. Now we're going to have a more refined conceptual abstraction. And again, this is a retort to the argument of the conceptualists, the pop artists, the people going to symbols who were saying, no, it's the concept of the art that makes it art, not the actual execution. And so this is a way of keeping it about the execution, but emphasizing the concept. I think I've said this three times. Let's move on. At any rate, it's interesting to see his evolution in this because when Clement Greenberg first saw Barnett Newman, he didn't think much about him. But by the end of the 1950s and the beginning of the 1960s, he had actually swapped Barnett Newman and uh, de Kooning in his mind. De Kooning was kind of his champion and hero at the beginning. Then he kind of had a man crush for a while on Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock wraps his car around a tree and that's the end of Jackson Pollock, and then his man crush shifts over to Barnett Newman because of the simplicity of it. And so in 1964, Clement Greenberg uh, organizes an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. And in this, he highlights the works of a number of these artists, okay? So abstract expressionism, which, you know, and painterly abstraction had dominated you know, everything right up into the late 50s, and then you have pop art and concept and everything else kind of, you know, washing over it as the hot new fads. And so Clement Greenberg's got to make an argument for, you know, a new kind of abstraction, for a preservation of abstraction. And he says, by contrast with the interweaving of light and dark gradients in the typical abstract expression of picture, all the artists in the show move towards a physical 
openness of design or towards linear clarity or towards bold, which is just a fancy way of saying they're not going to be using big sloppy brush strokes anymore. They're going to be using pure color. The movement was towards pure color. Let's make it entirely about pure color and pure form. And so he just goes with it. And so we have a number of artists that come up that are painting in something that is around the fringes of what you might call abstract expressionism that move in that direction. Kenneth Nolan is probably the first and the most important of these. And he takes a reductive approach, moving towards clear icons, clear kind of geometric symbols, uh, if you will. I guess not symbols, but constructions is probably a better word, because he's not trying to evoke a particular symbol like the pop artists, but he is moving to solid, simple geometric shapes. He said, I think of painting without subject matter as music without words. And that was his goal, was just simply to create it. And so when you see the kind of things he's painting in the late 50s, they have a series of concentric circles. And you can see that there's a lot more concentration on design and form and composition than in the abstract expressionists. But notice all those sloppy brushstrokes. We're still not free from pure, you know, kind of painterly expression. But increasingly, his targets get tighter and tighter <laughs> until oh, there's only a little brush strokes on the side. And then he moves into pure concentric circles or shapes like targets. Now, remember, who else had gone to targets by this time? Jasper Johns, that's right. So Jasper Johns was moving towards targets. Uh, Robert Indiana was doing kind of circles and patterns and symbols as well. So... You know, this reduction of form to something that's immediately recognizable has a lot of parallels with pop art. In a way, post-gestural abstraction was a way of turning the abstract movement into a kind of pop art movement. Uh, turning it into something that was clean, pure, iconic. Now, I think Clement Greenberg would have just he would have cracked a molar if you'd have said that to his face. <laughs> I think if you'd have gone to it and said, you realize by them just going to simple concentric circles and chevrons and things like this, that this is the pop artification of abstraction. I think he'd have cracked a molar and uh, maybe he would have, maybe he would have, you know, got into a slap bite with me. Uh, but it's true. You can see that, it, that pop art was all about saying, hey, you know, the world is being objectified. Let's turn things into objects. Let's elevate the object, the consumer object, to high art. It's the visual vocabulary we understand. And sure enough, I, I'm, I'm convinced that that's got to be some of the notion. No one ever articulated it like that. No one ever did. But come on, when you see Kenneth Nolan's things that he started producing in the mid-60s, things like these V-shapes, these chevrons, in simple flat colors, and towards the end of the 60s, he starts painting in just absolutely flat shapes. Now, if you look at a Barnett Newman or a Rothko, you can tell that those, those colors were lovingly laid down in glaze after glaze after glaze to create this kind of hazy sense of depth and vibrance. But you look at a Kenneth Nolan and it honestly looks like it was sprayed on <laughs> or put on with a roller. It, he wanted that flatness because he didn't want that kind of level of expression. The expression was coming out of the color. And he, he keeps moving to color of, as a form of expression. And then he starts moving to different kinds of polygonal canvases, things that the canvas interacts as part of the abstract shape. Okay, So what's interesting is that by doing this, you are emphasizing the objecthood of the painting in a way that you wouldn't have before, because you're, you're incorporating just the actual shape of the painting into it. This is a way of affirming the objecthood. But again, I can't help but look at these and feel like, again, they feel like very branded images. They feel like the, the, the counterpoint to what we might have seen in pop art, a way of making the art punchier, uh, more iconic, more like a brand, uh, more like consumer, you know, brands and marketing in that way. The other one who's doing this is Joseph Albers. Now, Joseph Albers 
has a, a long history in modernism. Uh, Joseph Albers was, of course, a teacher at Bauhaus. He did these long lectures, famous for doing these lectures on color theory and for creating these complex paintings to explain color theory, or at least his view of color theory. So he was a modernist right there from the very beginning. But he, too, jumps into this and starts creating these forms, these things like homage to the square, where we just have pure solid color. And again, look at this. You can actually see the canvas underneath this thing. There's no attempt to layer this. There's no attempt to, uh, you know, create gauzy layers where you brush out the brush strokes with uh, a turpentine soaked rag like a Rothko would. Uh, no, this is just pure kind of taped up, painted, squared off. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's the kind of thing that a sign painter could paint, uh, which isn't a slam on sign painters. Sign painters are amazing. That's an amazing skill. But it's, it's focused on this kind of level of precision. I think the person who took this to the greatest extremes is going to be Ad Reinhardt. Reinhardt is an American artist uh, who starts out as an abstract expressionist, but very, very quickly starts moving into territory of just pure, solid colors. Uh, I have to I have to give a shout out to uh, Reinhardt because he's probably the purest expression of this idea of moving away from any kind of representation or any kind of any kind of gesture to the to the to the degree that the painting almost you know disappears. He said, as an artist, I would like to eliminate the symbolic pretty much. For black is interesting not as a color uh, but as a non-color and as the absence of color. So he's very famous doing these black paintings. I also have to give him a shout out because he liked to do cartoons. Uh, so he did cartoons uh, talking about art and uh, I have a great love of cartoons. I, I actually used to be a cartoonist for my school newspaper and uh, so I love how this and it says what do you represent? That's fantastic. Uh, so you are a space too. Uh, Ad Reinhardt was so committed to this that he actually developed uh, 12 technical rules and he often called these, you know, uh, 12 things to avoid. And the first was no texture. That is that the painting shouldn't have any texture. Impasto, light, gauzy, it, it should, uh, no palette knifing, no canvas stabbing, no paint scumbling, none of those things. Uh, there's no accidents, no automatism, nothing. Uh, there's no brushwork or calligraphy is number two. Number three is no sketching or no drawing. He said in uh, painting, the idea should exist in the mind before the brush is taken up. So do you see what we mean about this is the response to conceptual art? This is the, this is the hard edged, uh, you know, we sometimes do call this hard edge painting. This is the response to conceptualism. Number four was no forms. He says the finest has no shape. So no forms. Five, no design. That's really kind of fascinating that, you know, his stuff, and you can see that his stuff is going to be, I'll just skip ahead here, his stuff is going to be simplistic crosses and shapes, and they are all made up of equal squares in dimension. So he actually kind of takes design out of the issue. Um, the next one is going to be no colors, and everything he does is going to be like an iteration of color. Uh, then he goes on to say no light, so there's no, there's no like shading or tone, no space. The space should be flat and empty. And he said no time, that there's no sense of passage of time in these things, no size or scale. Uh, when you look at these paintings, and some of them are quite large, they, they really do not betray scale. They would work every bit as well as tiny little paintings. No movement, everything should be still. No object, no subject matter, no symbols, images, or signs. Uh, neither pleasure nor pain, no mindless working or mindless non-working, no chess playing, as he put it. Well, okay, well, there you go. <laughs> when you take all of that out, what are you left with? You're left with this. You're left with these really hard edge paintings. Now, some of his earlier work, you can actually see the distinctions. He's dealing with colors, and some of these are more rose, some of these are more orange, and they just become kind of variations. But pretty soon, um, by the 1960s, he's doing pure and solid paintings. And now I hate to break, this is kind of hard to see. In fact, even in the gallery, this is insanely difficult to see. 
but this is actually not a solid black painting. It actually is an assemblage of squares and overlapping colors that are very, very closely, uh, you know, to each other. Uh, here you can see it. Do you see the cross? You see, let me, let me, I'll just kind of highlight the space here in case I can't see how well this is going to turn out on the video, but you know, you can see that this is essentially nine squares of equal size, and we have one color across the front, another color behind, just two crosses that, you know, if you, if, 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 you know, you don't squint at it really hard, you can't even hardly see it. Here's one where you can see that there's a subtle difference in the blue. But this, this stuff is really very, very subtle stuff. This hard edge painting. Well, then that brings us to Ellsworth Kelly. So Ellsworth Kelly was an American artist who, again, coined the term hard edge painting and was moving in this direction too. So what's interesting is that a lot of these artists were painting this way even in the early 50s, but nobody was paying any attention to them. Uh, they didn't want to paint in the, you know, kind of gestural style or the painterly style, all these loose splattering brush strokes. So it wasn't until later in the mid 60s that this started to take off and he started creating what he called his spectrum paintings. He said, I think that if you can turn off the mind and look only with the eyes, ultimately everything becomes abstract. And I think that's a, it's a good starting point. This thing looks like, you know, you're looking at a very, very tight close-up of, of an 8-bit graphic. Uh, you know, you have just large colors, an assemblage of colors. But he started simplifying his colors, going to, you know, pure black and white. Again, these are regimented squares over and over again, just broken into different segments. What he's most famous for is these large-scale paintings that would use just three colors or two colors, red, green, and blue, with very, very simple hard edge shapes. Uh, this was, you know, the way he was painting towards the early 60s and the middle of the 60s. And then pretty soon he started moving into what he called his spectrum paintings, where he would simply paint rainbow spectra, one paint, one color after the other. And then eventually getting to the point where he would paint one canvas after the other. So each one of these is just, again, utterly smooth. You can't see the details. So all of this, these ideas about reducing form ultimately come together into a new movement that we call minimalism. Now, minimalism just means that, again, you are reducing the form to the most minimal extent. So again, very much like what Kazimir Valovich was trying to do in his suprematism, move it to the zeroth degree. What's interesting is almost all of the minimalists hate the term minimalism. This was a term given to it by critics. Uh, Donald Judd preferred the term purism. Uh, or even referred to it as classicism, which is interesting. That they saw what they were doing as an extension of, you know, the great art of the past, but it was just distilled down to this pure form. And so it is contemporary to pop art and hard edge painting. Minimalism is the difference between minimalism and hard edge painting, mostly, is that minimalism deals with the third dimension. Hard edge painting is going to be flat, it's going to be on the wall, whereas minimalism is going to break free into the third dimension. Uh, and so you could call it a sculptural response to post-painterly abstraction. And that makes sense. If, you, if you're the team, you know, if you've got one camp of artists who say the object is nothing, <laughs> and you're on the other team saying the object is everything, then how do you increase the objecthood of painting? You do it by making it th three-dimensional. You know, a two-dimensional surface can only have so much objecthood, but if you make it a three-dimensional space that comes into people's space, then that increases the objecthood. The other thing that they do is they increase the scale, make it sculptural, but then they also use industrial materials. 
many of these artists will use hard edge industrial materials to create aluminum or glass boxes, things that really are impossible to get around, and their hardness again reinforces their objecthood. And they see this, you know. And what's interesting is it's a kind of purest form. Uh, my term for this is to call it high church modernism. So, okay, now we're going to go into theology for a second. <laughs> Sorry, my, I, was, I was originally a medievalist. I have to, I have to go to my first love. Uh, but in churches, in church practice, you have high churches and low churches. And that isn't supposed to be like a slam or anything. Uh, it's just a technical term. And the technical term is used to describe what is the focus of the church. If the church is focused on formalism, that is, the rites and the ordinances, the performances of the mass and the liturgy, things like the Catholic Church or the Anglican Church or the Orthodox Church, then that's a high church. That's where it is the ordinance, it's the liturgy, it's the form that matters. But low churches are churches that focus on the spoken word. Uh, where, you know, and you can see this in architecture. You can see that Protestant churches, the pulpit is at the center of the church, whereas in a Catholic or an Orthodox church, the altar is at the center of the church because the right is what matters and the pulpit is off to the side. Okay? So it's a question between, you know, form or meaning. Do you do you emphasize form or do you emphasize kind of, you know, didactic meaning or instruction? Now, purists were so strict about emphasizing the word and the spoken word and the kind of reason and meaning behind something over the liturgy and over the, the ritual that they got rid of altars together. You know, if you're familiar with hymns, there's a famous hymn that says, now we gather around the board. Well, the board is the altar. They sometimes would literally just place a board across two chairs or they would hinge a board to the wall, the side of the building, so they could lift it up so they could do the communion or the Eucharist, and then when they were done, they would put it down because they didn't want those big fancy altars like Catholics had because they saw that as a form of idolatry. So you have low churches and high churches. Interesting question for our our uh, <laughs> our majority religion in the Ute here in the Utah Valley, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly known as Mormons. Is it a high church or is it a low church? Debate amongst yourselves. Sorry, I had to interject that. So why do I call this high church modernism? I call this high church modernism because it's concentrating on form, that it elevates form above everything else. Whereas the pop artists and the conceptualists were about ideas, about the reason, the meaning behind it, much like Protestants were about the spoken word and reading of scriptures and homilies and sermons, these people are all about the formal experience. And so this is high church modernism. And I gotta tell you, I absolutely love it to death. I love high church modernism. I absolutely love it today. And it's still going on strong today. I titled this section in the syllabus, I call it Survivals and Echoes, because modernism kind of comes to an end somewhere in the 60s or 70s. It's hard to know where contemporary begins and modernism ends. But modernism doesn't die. It continues to have these survivals. And the ideals of modernism continue to resonate through many different movements, including minimalism, but also post-minimalism, and also land art and light art, and all kinds of movements that are still going. And it seems like every 20 years or so, we have another revival and kind of geometric abstraction. So all of this was about emphasizing the objecthood. And in a way, it's really interesting that, again, this ties minimalism back to pop art. Pop art was all about you know, taking the visual culture of consumerism and saying, hey, it's objectified us. We're going to hold the object and show the object to everyone. And Donald Judd, with his, again, forms, was, again, making this a solid, you know, hard object and that could be recognized as a kind of icon. Again, you know, if, if, I, could, you know, if I could get uh, Clement Greenberg to crack a molar, I could probably get Donald Judd to have an aneurysm because Donald Judd absolutely despised pop artists. He started out as a critic and he was most sharply critical of Andy Warhol, who he thought was kind of a gimmick. And it was pop art that convinced Donald Judd to give up 
art criticism and go into art and become one of the premier minimalists of the time. But, you know, when you look at his manufactured boxes, they're very similar in spirit and tone to the manufactured processes of pop art. So there is a response. Minimalism is the kind of conceptualization. It's like, okay, if conceptualism is the, the rule of the day, we're going to defend it. But we're going to defend it, and we're going to defend objecthood and craftsmanship. So if pop art and concept was about, you know, getting rid of those things and debasing craftsmanship and those things, we are going to bring it back and uh, create it. But it's not an accident that, you know, both Donald Judd and, and uh, Andy Warhol loved the repetition of forms for that reason. So the first person that we could probably um, talk about as a minimalist is going to be Frank Stella. So Frank Stella was famous for these monochrome paintings. And he said that you know, a painting is a flat surface with paint on it. <laughs> That's a, a pure expression of of uh, Clement Greenberg's ideal could not be stated. And what you see is what you see, you know, and it is what it is. Now, he, he called these, you know, monochrome paintings. But what's interesting about his monochrome paintings is that his monochrome paintings, again, were a response to the object and the canvas. He wouldn't, you know arbitrarily decide where to put the bends in his lines. What he would do is he would paint to where the supports of the canvas already were. So, I mean, they, where they already were. So why did he put this angle in the corner? Well, because that is where the frame was, and he just arbitrarily painted that and then just continued to fill in the space. So in a way, his paintings are actually a way of accentuating the sculptural form of the canvas itself. Uh, perhaps the most famous example of this uh, is this one, uh, the Fanny Hawk. And in this case, this was a stretched canvas. The stretched canvas had two stretcher bars behind it because it was a large canvas. And he just used that as his starting point. The width of his lines here is exactly the same width of the stretcher bars underneath the canvas. So he isn't even, he isn't choosing the width of his painted line. He isn't choosing its location. He is reinforcing the objecthood of uh, the, uh, the uh, object. And what's interesting here is his titles were often uh, dry and ironic, uh, sometimes darkly so. This one uh, comes from a Nazi anthem, Raise the Flag. Well, of course, it's a cross, and the Nazi flag did include, you know, this kind of swastika or cross. But what he's doing here is he's creating a kind of arbitrary cross to create a flag. He's emphasizing the objecthood. Again, you know, dealing with the irony of it here. And sometimes, just to prove that he could, he would do the same thing, but do it at a diagonal. Again, why is this bend here because that's where the stretcher bars are behind the canvas and the width here is exactly the same width as the stretcher bars. So all of the cues in the painting are being taken from the structure of the canvas itself and then it's hung on a wall without a frame so it really feels more like a shallow sculpture that's been uh, accentuated in that regard. So it makes sense that by the mid-60s he would start creating these paintings that were shaped paintings. Now, these are paintings, but much like Ellsworth Kelly, he starts changing the canvas to fit the form that he wishes to create. So he takes the same chevron shape here, and essentially it is the same chevron shape repeated four times, repeated over at different angles. Again, this takes the artist out of the equation uh, the line here is, again, the exact same width of the stretchers behind. And so when it's amassed on the wall, it really does have this kind of object to it. It feels more like a kind of sculpture, like a low wall sculpture. He would do this, you know, many times, making these kind of shaped canvases that really can't be understood unless you, you kind of, you know, uh, take a look at them in, in person and see them at scale. 
one of the responses to this is this kind of short-lived movement known as op art. Op art was kind of a minimalist interpretation of pop art. You want to give people grabby images, we will do that, but we will do that in a way that gives this kind of illusion of depth. This, of course, is a flat painting, but because they have, you know, altered the width of these kind of checkerboard pattern, it gives it a sense of depth. It feels like it kind of dips here in the middle, but of course it's utterly and completely flat. Uh, Victor uh, Vasarelli was probably the, the most famous of this kind of technique, and here you can see how he alters squares with circles to create things that feel tighter. He alters the size of squares to make things feel tighter, to give a sense of push and pull to the painting. But the painting has no push and pull, it's a flat surface. Again, playing with the surface in this way and creating the sensation of a kind of variegated surface is a way of increasing the arbitrary objecthood of this thing. He was he would famously do this, you know, creating these kind of uh, you know push and pull paintings. But it, but much in the same way as Frank Stella, these paintings are completely arbitrary. There is no you know kind of choice being made here. He's using. Well, there are choices, but he's using squares, and once you decide to alter this, it create this kind of sensation or this surface. Uh, that is the kind of pure expression of it. Op art kind of dies out by the mid-60s, but minimalism continues on. Uh, one of the most important, I think, is Anne Truitt. And Anne Truitt is another one of these artists that I personally got to meet. Anne Truitt uh, was donated, donated her uh, collected records and papers to Bryn Mawr College. And I was working at Bryn Mawr College at the time in the Visual Resource Department in the Reese Carpenter Library. Uh, if you go there today, uh, don't bother looking for it because Visual Resources is dead. It's a dead profession. No one does slides anymore. Uh, but we have this beautiful glass window that looked over the, the Reese Carpenter Library. And uh, I got the privilege of making up a website to, uh, to go along with this event, this small little show of her papers that were being donated to the archives. So I got to meet her, a uh, lovely woman. And, uh, and that was really my first introduction to her, and, and she really is an unsung hero. She was doing this at a time when, you know, not even Donald Judd was making this, so she really is one of the first uh, sculptors. Uh, and minimalist sculptures. But what's interesting is she doesn't really think of these as she described these as, you know, I make the sculptures so that I can have 3D paintings. I can have paintings in a th three third dimension, which I think you'll you get when you take a look at it. She would build these large plinths, and they're generally made out of plywood or varieties of wood, and then they would have very kind of minimal treatment to the services but then she would paint them in colors. So here we have Insurrection. Look at the date, 1962. This is long before Donald Judd you know, got into the game. Donald Judd was still fuming at uh, Andy Warhol at this point. And you can see how pushing this into the third dimension gives these colors a form. And again, you know, to use her terms, she, she described these as not sculptures, but painting in the third dimension. I love her plinths, these tall rectangular pieces where she would create bands of color. Again, no painterly surfaces, they're utterly flat, uh, kind of flat color, so that the color and the change of the color, the subtle change of the color, would only really come as you saw it in, in in a third dimension. What I love is that this blue almost looks like it sticks out farther than the green and the pink, but it's not. It's a perfectly fat, sur flat, flat surface. I also like how she made these plinths uh, have a smaller base so that they do seem to float rather than to kind of rest directly on the ground. And then she would do a, a series of these, uh, sometimes in the same room, interacting with each other, and sometimes with vertical stripes. So it's Donald Judd, though, that really comes to define minimalism. I mean, he's the one that people think of minimalism. Again, from 1959 through 1965, he was uh, an art critic, 
and wrote rather scathingly about uh, the pop artist, particularly Andy Warhol. And I think that, you know, about the time Andy Warhol was giving up on art and going to the factory and doing all his crazy, uh, you know, films and acting as the manager for uh, the Velvet Underground and a bunch of other things, he decided he had to get into the game. And he described all paintings as spatial. That is that whether you like it or not, ultimately this, this idea of, you know, making something two-dimensional doesn't work, that there is a spatial component to a painting. And so he was influenced strongly by Stella's shaped paintings and started creating boxes. The first boxes he created, uh, he started doing himself. But he quickly found that he really didn't have uh, the skill to make these things <laughs> as solid or as uh, industrial as he wanted them to be. So most of his works he then just described, he designed, and then he gave them over to engineers and manufacturers to fabricate. And that's a common practice to this day, that an artist will design a piece, but actually hand the fabrication of the piece over to professional welders, sheet metal workers, etc. And so he started making these things, uh, these blocks, these cubes, and he set them directly on the floor in the middle of the gallery. They weren't pushed up against the wall, and this forced people to walk around them. Again, what's interesting is there's some a quality of minimalism is that it basically forces you to interact with the object, and this heightens the objecthood. Someone once described Donald Judd's pieces not as sculptures, but as as um, theater sets, which I think is an excellent way of describing it. That it creates a setting like a theater or a play, and you are the player, and you have to walk around the set and interact with it. And so these big, large cubes of, you know, unforgiving metal. Uh, I do know a story of somebody who tripped and landed into one and hurt it themselves. They actually bled on a Donald Judd. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Art nerds! We're the weirdest kind of nerds. I bled on a Donald Judd! It was so awesome! Anyhow, not my story, by the way. That was someone who told me that story. They, they tripped and fell on a Donald Judd. So those edges are sharp, man! That's, that's how much he wanted to emphasize the objecthood of these things, that they were engineered to such tolerances that they were actually sharp. Uh, so watch yourself. Uh, don't, don't trip and fall. So he would use these, uh, you know, highly industrialized, polished surfaces. Uh, brass, bronze, aluminum, plexiglass. Oh, I forgot to mention, I was going to say that uh, there was a, an aerospace firm in Massachusetts uh, you don't think of Massachusetts being an aerospace place. You think of places like, uh, you know, uh, Florida and and, uh, and uh, California where they, you know, built, or maybe, you know, uh, Seattle where Boeing is. But there was an aerospace firm in Massachusetts in the 1960s, and it wasn't Donald Judd, but it was another one of these artists, and he couldn't build these things to the in high engineering tolerances that he wanted. So he outsourced it to this engineering firm, and the engineering firm was like, you know, we build modern jets, people. You know, we don't build, you know, art, you know, and it's just crazy boxes, you know, crazy kids. But they took the job, and they did such a good job that they developed a reputation for it, and then more artists started coming to the same engineering firm. So because that happened, they realized, well, wait a minute, maybe there's money here. <laughs> we, you know, we all got engineering degrees so we could join NASA and send uh, astronauts to the moon, but uh, our career ended up being making uh, sharp, really sharp aerodynamic uh, tolerances for, uh, you know, these crazy artists. And so there's now quite a few firms that are engineering firms that uh, engineer and design these things. And they, they do, man, they are incredible. Uh, you know, you would think they were aerospace engineering that now are, are, have converted completely to creating artwork that, that make large scale installations. So kind of crazy. So interesting little thing where, you know, the economics of art kind of impacted engineering. You too could be an engineer on a, on a famous artist's work. So when we look at it, he often, again, took the same scale of shape. Again, I love this one. You have an aluminum tube that goes through and then it's surrounded by uh, tinted amber plexiglass. 
giving you the sense of the shape, but also giving you the sense of the interior shape. And then he starts multiplying these shapes. Sometimes, uh, again, laying them on the floor, but also putting them against the wall. Uh, some of my favorite series, all of his are untitled because he doesn't want you to think about the object. He wants you to think about uh, he wants you to think about the object, not to think about any kind of title that he's come up with. He doesn't want you to get lost. He wants you to concentrate on what you're looking at. And so here we have, you know, this series of, you know, like 10 boxes spaced the exact same distance as the box apart, mounted on a wall. And this is where I think, you know, this argument that Donald Judd is actually a classicist works because this is a classical proportion, that we see these same kind of proportions in classical sculpture. So what he does is he takes out the Venus de Milo and he leaves you with the box that the Venus de Milo could have come in. <laughs> so it's kind of a, an interesting thing. And so he makes these uh, several iterations uh, and continues this well into the 80s. Um, he creates a series of boxes with alternating shapes. So you're confronted with the same shape but with different internal geometries. And then in the early 80s, he took a trip out to Marfa, Texas. Uh, Marfa, Texas has recently popped up in the news. I'm sure you've all here heard about Kitten Lawyer, this poor lawyer who was at a judicial hearing <laughs> who couldn't take the kitten filter off of his Zoom meeting. Well, he was from Marfa, Texas, and I thought that's just too perfect. Uh, I used to live in Alpine, Texas. I, I used to go to Marfa, Texas all the time. Marfa, Texas is a very, very remote West Texas town. It's flat landscape all around. It's this kind of austere environment. And he actually drove through it one time, and I think he broke down there, and he fell in love with the space. And he, there was an old abandoned army air base. And in the army air base, they used to, there used to be a prisoner of war camp for Nazis back during World War II. And he took it over and he refurbished it. And that harsh West Texas sun and landscape was perfect for the kind of things that he wanted to produce. So here he stripped out the walls and replaced them with windows. And he put a hundred untitled works in mill aluminum. Each one is exactly the same dimensions, but the interior geometries are different. Which of course give you an endless variety of shadows. I mean, look how dark the shadow is on this one. And then look how, because this has a hole in the center, this is kind of illuminated with reflected light. And every single one of these, and it's different every time you go there, love this piece, every time you go there it, it takes on a different quality. You get the sense of how of what that person meant when they said that you're really not looking at a sculpture, you're, you're actually at a theater piece that, that is there interacting with the light and the sun and the day. He also put 15 works of uh, untitled works in concrete. Uh, locals think this is an abandoned kind of uh, culvert project, but it's not. It's actually art. And it's, again, the same form, the same exact dimensions, but at different orientations. Sometimes with the holes going through the long direction, some not through. And what I love about this installation is you can get right close to it. They don't prevent you from uh, touching this. You walk through it. It has this quality of feeling like Stonehenge, the way it kind of focuses your attention on some vistas in one ways and other vistas the others. Here you can see here we have the same shape repeated, but you can look through the light this way, but not this direction. You look through it this way. So really kind of uh, amazing. And you know, I'm ripping through these, but really quite beautiful. And because of this, he, you know, decided that there needed to be a place for large scale installations of this kind. And that's how he ended up founding the Chinati Foundation and the Judd Foundation. Uh, the Chinati Foundation is still there and has uh, a collection of uh, a whole series of works, many more that we'll talk about. Uh, Dan Flavin, a uh, famous light artist, has a huge installation there as well. So then we get to Tony Smith. Tony Smith gets his start painting as an abstract expressionist and quickly moves over into minimalist sculpture. Some of his early works, you can see he was moving in that direction. This is one of his uh, paintings. Again, much like Ad Reinhardt, this is entirely dictated by the circle. This is the same space divided into, uh, in this case, 15 circles. And some circles are joined into kind of lozenge shapes. 
others are left independent. But you could see that in the same way as Frank Stella at Reinhardt, hard edge painters, he was refusing to force himself on the painting. He would kind of create an arbitrary shape and then that would dictate the terms of the shape. And it's in this context that he started creating his first sculptures. And this was one of his uh, first major sculptures. This was die. Of course, the die is a six-sided figure, but this is just a, a cube. Again, he conceived this in 1962. There are several iterations of this. Uh, this one here particularly was fabricated in 1968. Again, industrial materials. This is made out of core 10 steel. Core 10 steel is a steel that naturally rusts, this kind of ruddy brown, rust orange kind of color. And then this develops a protective patina. So this stuff will just last for eons. It, it doesn't rust and decay away like most iron will. It will actually hold on for a long time. And he really felt that it should be made on a human scale, you know, that again, it frames the space, you know, too big to be an object, too small to be a work of architecture. You know, he called these forms and presences rather than sculptures, things that, you know, forced you to move around them, that knowingly kind of dispossessed you from the, sh from the area. You know, you have this large kind of cubic form that you can't get around. He likewise would plan and plot out shapes that would take on different identities depending on how you approach them. So on one end, this thing uh, is a tall plinth, and from one perspective looks like a tall plinth, but on the other it feels like a low kind of bench-like form. One of my favorite examples of this is Amaryllis. Amaryllis is just kind of a magical object to me. Amaryllis uses a prism shape. And the thing about a prism is that, you know, it only presents a kind of one edge towards you, but it shifts dramatically. Here it feels sharp and blocky, but you turn around to the other side and it gets kind of thin and almost blade-like. Walk around to the far side once again and the bench disappears. This is all the same object, by the way. You know, you almost can't understand this thing unless you have like a 3D model you can rotate around with it. Uh, just, you know, it would be a great project, actually, uh, these 3D spaces. So how you present yourself, how the object presents itself to you, how it orients itself to you, whether it seems big or fat or large, Again, creating and reestablishing the objecthood, the form and the presence of the thing. This one is one he did for the LA County Museum of Art. It's a massive scale installation. This one's called Smoke. This is one of his later works. But again, you can see how these prismatic shapes at time make the joins look very thin, uh, but then at other points make it look kind of massive and imposing uh, from a different perspective forcing the person into a dialogue with it, like a theatrical set. The person who probably um, most defines what minimalism is going to be is Carl Andre. So Carl Andre started with these industrial materials. Again, he was probably the most reductionist of these, Again, inspired by Frank Stella, uh, worked with Frank Stella, and would take standard sizes of lumber, so nominal sizes of lumber right from the hardware store, things that he didn't have to cut or craft in any way, and then started stacking them up. And he would cut notches into them so that they could be kind of assembled, almost like little wooden puzzles. Here he is uh, assembling one of his earlier puzzles, you know, kind of pieces to create these towers. But he said about these pieces that he was very unsatisfied with them because he was, again, imposing form on them. And he said, I realized the wood was better before I cut it than after. I did not improve it in any way, which is a kind of amazing humility about your objects and materials. So instead of stacking them up and, you know, cutting them to fit, he just cut them to length and stacked them and created cubes. So here, each one of these, you know, he stacks it up 
alternates the row to create a simple shape. And this was really, again, really out there for people at the time. Now again, this is high church modernism. He's concerned about the form and the sense of the form and using these standardized shapes. But this is really, again, a response to the conceptualism of the conceptual artists and the pop artists, creating something that is just an instantaneous object. And this is when he started to do his equivalent series. He uh, started using fire bricks, and of course fire bricks are a set dimension. Bricks are all standardized in size, and that makes it easy for you to stack and build. You know that one brick is exactly like the other brick. And that allowed him to just take assemblages of bricks and stack them to explore all of the different ways that a simple shape could reiterate its own shape. So this was one of the first that he did, but then he started doing a whole series of these that he, he did in a whole variety of forms. And he called this his equivalent series because each one of these constructions takes exactly 120 bricks. But with those 120 bricks, you know, it makes a difference of whether you stack it, you know, you know, three across the lengthways or three across the narrow ways, or whether you stack it two deep or one deep. Each one of these has an exactly equivalent mass and volume, but takes a variety of forms. And in doing so, creates a really an intense variety of expressions and forms. This also caused one of the greatest art scandals of the 20th century when one of these, uh, equivalent number eight, which I think is this one right here, <laughs> was bought uh, by the Tate. So the Tate was the, the modern museum. Uh, actually, the Tate, the Tate was the British Museum, and now the Tate has split into three museums, but at the time it was all one museum. But they were the museum that collected modern art, and so now this is in the Tate Modern. And so they purchased this in 1972. Now, this really pushed people's concepts of what minimalism could be. How minimal could you get? <laughs> I mean, this isn't even something, you know, un I mean, Donald Judd's, yeah, people could wrap their heads around that because those actually had to be made. They had to be designed. They had to be made. But in the same way that Frank Stella was letting the space of the, the distance of the stretchers determine the form of the painting, he just said, well, why bother? Why bother with even going that far? We'll let the brick determine the form. And so really it's a stack and a pile of, of fire bricks and nothing else. And so when this was purchased by the, purchased by the Tate in 1972, oh my gosh, uh, the British um, press just ripped it. Uh, you know, and thought it was just absolutely, uh, you know, uh, a mockery. And so, again, this ability to create scandalous, is it art, or is that absurd? The same kind of things that the crazy, uh, you know, performance artists were doing, <laughs> the crazy pop artists were doing, the minimalists, these high church modernists who were still committed to this abstract expression, they got there too. So you really can't say that there isn't this dialogue between the two, because it very much is. He would uh, continue to go on and play with this idea of kind of standardized shapes. These are steel and magnesium plates. Uh, one of the things that's really fun about a lot of Carl Andre's works is that while most artworks, uh, you know, they're behind a velvet rope and you're not supposed to walk on them, uh, you are supposed to walk on these, and you're encouraged to walk on them. Uh, and they are supposed to be something you are in, supposed to interact with, and you're supposed to be something that you stand on, because again, they frame the space. They have this theatrical component about it. They frame the space, and you walking and standing in them uh, is part of it. When we get to the post-minimalists and process artists like Richard Serra, you're going to see much the same thing. And Carl Andre is, you know, kind of still around uh, today. Or at least he was last I checked. This last year, is, we've lost a lot of artists. I always should check every few months. Um, I'm living here in my basement. Like a, like a, you know, I 
couldn't be any more in the dark if I was a mushroom in a mushroom farm. But here we are. <sighs> oh, boy. This breakdown, this nervous breakdown, was brought to you by uh, the pandemic. Moving on. And so he's still active. And he takes, again, the simplest things, but I, I like a lot of his pieces because it allows you to see the natural beauty in the object. This is his copper galaxy. Now, this is just copper flashing. So, you know, if you have a fancy copper roof, you have copper flashing. And these are bound up into tight bowls. This is an industrial object you can buy at a copper or a roof supplier. And he just let it unspool naturally on the floor to, of course, copper is this beautiful color to create all these luminous surfaces and reflected surfaces. Uh, let me tell you, it's really hard if you're a curator in a museum to curate a lot of these pieces because, holy crap, I mean, you know, I mean, when you move this, it's not going to be the same, you know, I mean, you, you, you can stack the bricks up pretty much identical, but when you move some of these things, by they're going to change, they're never going to be the same. They're going to have a certain kind of quality and, you know, the best you can hope for is to get something at a gesture, which gets us back to the abstract expressionists, that there is a kind of gestural quality to this, because in the reflections, I mean, how many different ways can you slightly unspool copper? Oh, wow. Well. So let's let's talk about Sol Lewitt. Sol Lewitt is, again, an American artist, and he was very interested in sculpture and process art. And he, again, really demonstrates this link between minimalism and conceptual art. Uh, he even borrows some of the ideas of the conceptualists. So people like Yoko Ono would write her instruction pieces, and anyone who performs those instructions, that is her work of art. Uh, likewise, Joseph Kosuth would write out things in his notebook, but never make them. And any of those were kind of a creation of his work of art. So conceivably, you could have thousands of iterations of Joseph Kosuth's one in three chairs, thousands of iterations of Yoko Ono's instruction pieces. And his stuff was very much the same. Again, starting in very simple forms and working through every possible iteration much like uh, these other artists allowing the shape of the material they're using to dictate what he's creating, he would do the same thing. So he did a series of these cubes, and these are incomplete cubes. But the series of cubes, what he does is he created every possible iteration of the outline of a cube. So a cube has six sides. Uh, with those six sides, it's going to have, let me do the quick head math, 16 edges. Uh, you know, and then he would calculate all the possible iterations and produce them. And he would actually create diagrams for this. This is really fascinating. Here is his diagram, the variations of incomplete open cubes, all the various possible combinations of these cubes. And sometimes he would do these in large scale so that you could walk around them. And sometimes he would just do them like iterations of his models. Uh, you know, all of the iterations of the cubes, uh, creating and multiplying these. And so this is moving into what we call process art. Process art we'll cover when we get to the post-minimalists. The post-minimalists were very much in the same idea, the same wheelhouse, ideological wheelhouse as the minimalists, but they objected to the kind of hard, shiny, industrialized surface and wanted to do something that was more interactive and more focused on the process. And so you see this blending coming together in some of his works. Here is his six inverted towers where again he takes the cube and thinks about all the possible iterations that could be created of it. Here is his serial project um, one A, B, C, D. In this case you can see these are all the possible volumes that can be constructed. You can have a square that is extracted into a cube or a column or a wireframe column, or that wireframe column can be inside a wireframe cube, or inside a solid cube, all of the different possible iterations. It's about this time that he starts creating art based on rule-based logic. And what he would do is he would issue diagrams, and with those diagrams he would issue uh, official certificates. and the certificates would give instructions on how to create and how to produce 
this work of art so that he didn't even have to produce it. So again, much like a lot of the pop artists by the end, Andy Warhol isn't making it, he's handing off to assistants, much like Donald Judd and others are handing these off to engineering firms, he would hand this over to the museum itself. And so the museum would actually, uh, you know, create it, you know, get a bunch of volunteers together. And again, I haven't never, I've never participated, but I have heard stories of people who have created Sol, Sol Lewitz, that have, they have created them for a museum. A museum got a hold of one of these certificates, got permission to, uh, to do their own iteration of it, and uh, produced it. So this one is, again, very simple. A wall divided vertically into 15 equal parts, each with a different line, direction, and color, and all combinations. Red, yellow, blue, black, pencil, first drawn by Chris Hansen, Nina Kamen, Al Williams. First installation, Jewish Museum, New York, New York, June 1970. And so if you had a wall and divided it up into these shapes, and you put the exact numbers of colors of lines that he suggests to put in, and you can see, you know, he's got the colors and the numbers of lines, you know, to put into it, and how it is supposed to be iterated, you can have a Sol Lewitt in your museum. But of course, the thing that's interesting about that is that it forces you to create a different work of art every time, because it's entirely dependent upon the space. So it crosses over into this, again, conceptual territory. So this one, for example, is uh, drawing 273. Uh, this is one that was first done in 1975, graphite and crayon on seven walls. And he talks about what you're basically going to do is you're going to take all of the corners that exist in this space and you're going to draw lines from those corners at certain distances. Well, that will give you uh, a building in, uh, you know, a different iteration, no matter which building you do. So here you can see all of these being created. And there's lots of these. This one is 260. Um, again, a series of lines. Uh, but here's 260 uh, created in a different space. And this one is one of his later works. This is 797. And here are two different inst installations of these tireless museum volunteers, I'm sure, are creating this, tracing one line after the other. And so by the time we get to the end of minimalism, we're really, sh we've really proven that minimalism is committed to the abstraction, to the foundational principles of abstraction that we saw at the very beginning of modernism in the beginning of the 20th century, but blended with this need to make it more conceptual. And this will continue on. We will see these same ideas percolate throughout the decades. We'll see it in the next group, which is going to be post-minimalism. Uh, and post-minimalism itself will begin to intersect with other areas. Post-minimalism actually begins to intersect with feminism. So we'll talk about that. So none of these things are happening in a vacuum. They are all bouncing off of each other. You can pluck out the strands of the tapestry, uh, but they all weave together. Now that's a labored metaphor. That's a good place to end the lecture. Oh my gosh. I feel like I ought to be holding up my pinky and, you know, it's a, just really kind of uh, guaranteed my membership in the wine and cheese crowd. Okay. We're going to end the lecture there. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye-bye.